my great pleasure. I thank Alexei Kostenko for this uh, invitation. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to present you the talk by Alexei from the University of Milan and the University of Vienna. about generalized indefinite feelings. Larislav, very difficult to hear. Can anybody else hear? Yes, yes, I can hear you well, and uh, I, I hope you can hear me well, too. Mm -hmm. okay. I guess, Alexei, we can hear Vlad you. Vladislav's volume is lower. Okay, uh, so... Uh, First of all, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, nice introduction. Uh, I'm going uh, to speak about, uh, uh, actually, uh, I'm not going to present a lot of results. Uh, it's uh, somehow the main idea is to uh, introduce, uh, somehow to present the new objects uh, in a, a spectral theory of uh, second order ODEs and uh, to indicate why this object might be useful. And uh, uh, it, it's based on, uh, uh, actually, on a series of work and which is uh, still ongoing uh, project with uh, uh, my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Jonathan Eckhart, uh, who is uh, currently in uh, Loughborough. So uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me indeed start. Uh, the main object, uh, I think, looks uh, rather simple. So this is uh, this second uh, order ODE. Uh, here Z is a complex number. Uh, it's a spectral parameter. So please let me know if you indeed can hear me well. And uh, Very good. Very yes. Good. Uh, okay. Yes, everything is oh. fine. Okay, yeah. if, uh, if something is unclear, feel free to interrupt me, uh, ask questions. Uh, okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, here is uh, the spectral problem, uh, which is quadratic in spectral parameter. So Z is a complex number, and it enters uh, in a nonlinear way, uh, but at most quadratic. L is uh, uh, just the length of the interval. It's a positive number. It's all, it can be infinite, of course, uh, uh, too. And the most important thing is, of course, coefficients. Uh, it is assumed that omega here these coefficients omega uh, where z is uh, yes okay it's it's hard uh, I I need to get used to Microsoft Teams uh, omega is uh, uh, is a distribution uh, uh, however it's assumed that it's h minus one uh, locally on uh, zero l and v is supposed to be uh, it's very important to be a positive real measure uh, distribution is real uh, yes it's written that it's uh, real. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, uh, we decided to call uh, such a, a triple, so there are three parameters uh, which determine this equation. It's uh, length L, omega, and uh, V, uh, a measure V. And uh, every such triple is called a generalized indefinite string. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. Why, why the term indefinite string? What's uh, indefinite string? I, I think I would be able to explain this uh, basically on the next slides already. And right. indefinite, indefinite because uh, omega here, so if you forget about just uh, take V equal to zero and just forget about it. Okay. And so then there will be omega and uh, we do not assume that omega is positive. So omega can take positive and negative values. So just you can also forget that it's distribution. So if you, you know, to feel yourself uh, comfortable, just assume that omega and V are nice functions, uh, smooth, okay. whatever. Right. And because omega is allowed to be, uh, like take pluses and minuses, it's indefinite. Uh, but this spectral problem, it comes out of, uh, out of uh, string equation. So just uh, the next slide and actually. So uh, the, the object uh, was indeed introduced uh, in this generality in 2014, and we decided to give this a uh, fancy name, but we, uh, did not uh, come up with something better. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but in fact, this object has uh, uh, a long history. Uh, of course, everybody, uh, I think, met uh, a string equation. That is, uh, if you have a string of lengths L, 
and uh, the density of uh, the mass density of a string is just take this v to be a positive uh, function on zero l. And then the total mass of each part uh, of interval a b is uh, just integral of v. And uh, equations of small oscillation of the string with uh, uh, fixed ends, uh, just Dirichlet boundary conditions, uh, uh, indicate that this. Uh, uh, the ends, are, the ends of, of this uh, string are fixed, and equations of motion are this very familiar wave equation. With uh, we usually in the second uh, year of I do not know when now it's uh, in the ODE course uh, v is taken just to be a constant. This is c, and uh, the way to solve this equation uh, it's uh, a lot of symmetries. Uh, it's just separation of variables. This is one of the standard approaches. So we just make this uh, standing wave ansatz, plug it into our equation, and uh, uh huh. So I think now it's just this size and. Wait a second. Yep. One ends up with uh, uh, this uh, spectral problem where lambda it's uh, with z from the previous slide, which enters uh, in the quadratic wave because it's a wave equation. So this is a, a special case of what we uh, had before. Uh, sometimes uh, this uh, omega on the previous slide, if one considers strings with damping, then uh, this linear term somehow it's called like a string with damping and some assumptions. But uh, unfortunately, I'm not a physicist and I prefer not to touch this uh, issue at all. Uh, uh, just I would like to give one more example where indeed this name for indefinite string, it's uh, not uh, our like uh, notion of generalized indefinite string, yes, but not indefinite. Uh, there are the so-called uh, very popular object. It's called uh, two-way diffusion equations. That is, we replace uh, wave equation by parabolic equation. Uh, that is, uh, it's only uh, one derivative in C instead of two from the previous slide. But here it's important to assume that uh, omega is uh, indeed uh, indefinite uh, in the sense that uh, in the current uh, situation, for example, uh, Botte equation introduced, I think, in 1927 in the paper of Botte, who got Nobel Prize in Physics, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he considered exactly this equation with omega equal to x, and this is called Botte equation. So this equation is uh, uh, parabolic for positive x, anti-parabolic for and anti-parabolic for negative x. And uh, Again, we can try to solve it by uh, separation of variables. We end up with the corresponding spectral problem, which is called indefinite string. And uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of issues related to actually how to pose boundary value problems uh, for this type of two-way diffusion equations. And uh, the literature is uh, uh, not huge, but uh, sufficiently large. And actually, all business uh, started from uh, this, uh, let me say, uh, seminal paper by uh, Richard Bills and uh, 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 because uh, the main issue here is uh, uh, somehow if you consider this equation in uh, the L2 space because omega is indefinite and uh, one takes uh, the natural choice of L2 Hilbert spaces L2 with weight omega but instead of omega one takes modulus of omega and then the corresponding uh, spectral problem is not self-adjoint. And one is interested uh, in uh, basisness properties of eigenfunctions for this problem. But I'm not going to touch this issue at all and just uh, uh, let me, uh, because uh, the main subject of my talk is uh, a bit different. And uh, uh, this is about uh, inverse spectral theory. So if we return to uh, a string equation and uh, again assume that uh, v is positive and uh, I prefer to like instead of z squared just uh, to write c. So suppose that v is uh, a very nice uh, function, at least uh, uh, integrable on zero L Dirichlet boundary conditions, uh, then uh, it's uh, standard to prove that uh, there is fundamental system of solutions, uh, science solution, cosine solution, and uh, this uh, also fact not very difficult that science solution for each uh, x is entire function of order one over two. Also, for if you take x equal to l, it's 
Still, uh, so the spectrum of this problem is the zero set of entire function of order one over two. And uh, under some additional assumptions, like smoothness assumptions, uh, I presume one needs to uh, suppose that V is uh, C2. Uh, then one can transform this problem into uh, 1D uh, Schrodinger equation. And uh, this formula here is, after this uh, Liouville type transformation, is just the standard uh, while asymptotic. Here it is. Uh, actually, this formula says that uh, the type of uh, uh, this function S, uh, S of L is exactly uh, the right hand side of this formula here. And uh, since uh, one can see here that uh, some indication that if you know the spectrum of this problem, uh, then you can say something already about uh, the uh, mass density of a string. Uh, the, uh, the question we can reformulate Mark Katz and ask, can one hear uh, the mass density of a string? And uh, I presume most of you know that, of course, the answer is no, because uh, spectrum is not enough and one needs uh, to know also, for example, norming constants. And uh, the subject here is uh, indeed uh, huge and everything started from uh, the work of Borg. And uh, seems uh, exactly for strings, there was uh, a paper by uh, Tikhanov, I think in the 1949, before Marchenka and before Gelfand and Levitan, and exactly about string who proved, and he proved uh, uniqueness. Uh, that is, if you have uh, eigenvalues and Norman constants, uh, and assuming V is L1, I think uh, in Tikhanov already proved that uh, uh, this is sufficient for uniqueness. And then there was fundamental works by Marchenka, Gelfand, Levitan, and Gelfand, Levitan, and Marchenka also proved uh, uh, the uh, presented procedure how to recover the uh, potential, if you know, eigenvalues and norming constants. But the main problem here is, of course, uh, characterization of spectral data. That is, uh, how to characterize uh, eigenvalues and norming constants. And uh, in this setting, in the setting for strings, because uh, if you, some of you might know that Marchenka and uh, Gelfand, Levitan, Crane, and the others, uh, they worked on one dimensional Schrodinger equation. So it's, uh, it looks like this problem, but spectral parameter here is in the wrong place. And uh, for strings, uh, the approach of uh, Gelfand, Levitan, and the others is uh, not suitable. One needs to assume some smoothness, then UV transformation, it's uh, actually a nightmare. And the right way to solve this problem was suggested by Mark Crane. And uh, the idea of Crane was, uh, 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 first of all, if you want to solve spectral problem for uh, this class of uh, uh, spectral problems, uh, first of all, you need to enlarge the class of problems. So the idea of uh, the main idea of one of the main ideas of Mark Crane was to consider uh, the class of problems where V is uh, allowed to be a positive Borel measure on zero L. Of course, if you write down this uh, second order ODE and uh, uh, say that V is a measure, uh, the first question is how to understand this equation. Uh, now there are several uh, several approaches, uh, and uh, the idea of uh, uh, Crane was uh, rather straightforward. And uh, he uh, he suggests to like if you have differential equation, just turn it into integral equation. And in fact, uh, the spectral problem uh, f is solution to S one if and only if f solves this rather nice integral equation. And despite the fact that V is a measure, it's, uh, one can use uh, standard tools to prove existence and uniqueness of solutions, analyticity and spectral parameter. This gives you, again, fundamental system of solutions, science solution, cosine solution, and so all the basic facts from the ODE can be uh, transferred exactly to this type of spectral problems. This is uh, once we have uh, a fundamental system of solutions, sine and cosine solution, uh, the main object now is uh, the so-called weil tishman function. Uh, the definition here is uh, a little bit uh, non-standard in the sense that there is this additional uh, z denominator in the denominator. Uh, so usually uh, uh, for Sturm-Liouville equations, it's just uh, cosine divided by sine without z. 
uh, I think I do not need to focus a lot on DC, but uh, if some of you have heard of, uh, on the notion of dual string, then this is uh, the well function, the well function of a dual string. But just ignore it. Uh, this object is well defined. Uh, uh, Crane like to call this uh, uh, object a coefficient of a dynamical uh, compliance of a string. Uh, I have no idea what does this mean, even in Russian. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the uh, the main properties of this M is the following fact. First of all, M is a Stilkes function. That is, uh, M is analytic away of the positive real line. Uh, also, uh, it admits, uh, uh, like, the definition of a Stilkes function is just analyticity away of the real line. It uh, uh, takes positive values on the negative, uh, for negative reals, uh, and uh, uh, basically, I think that's it. Uh, in fact, this is equivalent to this very nice integral representation. And in this integral representation, you already can notice that uh, some coefficients from uh, the spectral problem S1 already answer this integral representation for function M. In particular, the, uh, if uh, our uh, measure V has a point mass at zero, then uh, M goes to infinity, uh, uh, the limit at infinity is exactly this point mass of V at zero. Also, uh, the length of the string enters uh, the uh, the residue, uh, the reciprocal of uh, of the length is exactly the residue of uh, m at zero. And uh, the main object here is uh, the measure rho, and the measure rho is called a spectral measure. Uh, this means that uh, there is a way to associate an operator with spectral problem S1. Actually, it's uh, in general a linear relation. So it's, uh, I prefer again not to touch this, uh, but if V is uh, not a measure, it's a positive function and everything is nice, it's indeed operator and everything is good. And this, uh, this fact actually means that this operator is unitarily equivalent to the multiplication operator in L2 with this measure rho here. That is, uh, in other terms, this means that rho contains all the spectral information about this spectral problem as one here. Uh, yeah. In particular, yes. Uh, the, so, which, which is uh, the operator is unitary equivalent to the multiplication operator? Uh, unfortunately, I can't read it, but uh, if you look at S1, and suppose V is uh, a nice function, not a measure, it's just uh, a strictly positive function. On zero L, then you can divide by V both sides in S1, and your operator will be uh, just uh, you have one of minus one over V times second derivative. Okay. And you consider this operator in L2 zero L with uh, weight V, exactly V, and also you impose because uh, uh, we divide by S, we impose Dirichlet boundary condition. So this is exactly this operator. Okay. And this operator then unitarily equivalent to multiplication in rho. So this is pretty standard. Right. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you too. So uh, in particular, if we uh, just in the case of a regular string, just let me a little bit up, uh, then M is uh, meromorphic and uh, the integral representation is nothing but uh, uh, this nice sum here, where uh, both uh, uh, are exactly uh, the spectrum of our spectral problem, and uh, gammas are exactly uh, the norming constants, which are uh, defined as uh, reciprocals of uh, norms of the corresponding eigenfunctions, which are exactly sign solutions sitting at zeros. <clears throat> well, so. What I'm trying to say is uh, the following. Uh, so uh, each, uh, uh, each string is, uh, is determined by two parameters. It's uh, its length, L capital, and also its mass density V, this measure V. So uh, the set of strings is the set of all pairs L and V. For each L and V, we can associate the function M in exactly this way as it's written uh, in the second formula. So we just take uh, 
consign solution, sign solution, divide, and take the limits as uh, x goes to L. In particular, if we consider regular string, so we just take uh, x equal to L and that's it. So we have a map which maps uh, uh, each string, that is each pair L and V, into the set of all still TS functions. So N plus here is exactly the set of still TS functions. So because we said that M is uh, a still TS function. And uh, the main result of Mark Crane is uh, the fact that this map is homeomorphic. That it's, uh, uh, this map is uh, bijective. Uh, moreover, if we introduce suitable topologies, then this map becomes continuous and its inverse is also continuous. So. Uh, uh, in this case, actually, topologies are uh, quite simple in the sense that on the set of still yes functions, uh, the topology is uh, locally uniform convergence. And on the set of strings, uh, the topology is uh, weak star convergence of meshes. And uh, actually, this uh, very short and nice theorem contains also a complete solution of the inverse problem, because uh, if we take uh, uh, rational still yes functions, then in this case, one can uh, there is reconstruction procedure which is uh, uh, which goes back to still TS. And hence we can uh, approximate each uh, each M by rational functions, and this is uh, the solution of the inverse spectral problem. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, I would like to uh, give a comment that uh, Mark Crane did not publish a proof of these results. Uh, I do not know the reasons. Maybe uh, uh, the proof is contained in his uh, lecture notes because uh, the proof is based on uh, the so-called theory of the branch spaces, and uh, it can be found in this nice uh, book by uh, Dim and McKean. And in fact, uh, Crane was uh, interested uh, in solving this uh, inverse spectral problem for strings by uh, by a problem from uh, stationary processes uh, actually uh, the very famous problem that is if you uh, if you know the past can you predict the future uh, if you uh, know the whole past uh, then uh, the solution it's uh, a famous theorem of uh, i think several authors kalmagorov sigur crane and wiener and in this case one just uses uh, this is kalmagorov uh, Sigur Wiener Crane theorem, uh, that's uh, just uh, the methods of uh, Fourier analysis. Uh, but if you know only a part of the past, uh, then it's uh, uh, the standard Fourier analysis technique is, uh, is not working. And actually, uh, the way to, to solve this problem and to answer it is exactly the machinery with uh, Crane strings. So, uh, spectral measure is exactly the uh, measure which determines your know, stationary process and if you want to get the answer you need to recover a string and then you need to use that type formula which was on the previous slide it's uh, true in much wider generality it's formula this is called crane the branch formula and this type formula it actually gives you the answer on the problem whether pa uh, a part of the past can recover the whole future okay uh now uh, i would now I think it's after this very lengthy uh, historical introduction, I would like still to go to indefinite strings. So uh, suppose we uh, remove the assumption that V is a positive for L measure. So suppose we have omega, which is indefinite. It's, it's pluses and minuses, so it's a signed measure. Uh, the question is, what's, uh, what happens in this case? Uh, is it possible to extend uh, this nice solution of Mark Crane to the case of indefinite strings. Uh, there are several uh, uh, several reasons to do this. Uh, for example, uh, uh, in indefinite strings, it's uh, this type of uh, differential uh, spectral problems is uh, is actually a toy model in the theory of Crane spaces. Uh, uh, Crane spaces, uh, these are not the, the analog of uh, uh, Hilbert spaces, these uh, uh, spaces with uh, indefinite inner products. And uh, another option, uh, of another 
Uh, interest comes from uh, forward-backward parabolic equations, which I uh, briefly indicated. But uh, the main reason is actually uh, the relevance of uh, these spectral problems to nonlinear wave equations. Uh, the list is uh, uh, actually very long, but maybe the most important for us is uh, the kamasa holm equation, uh, which looks uh, uh, here it uh, looks rather nice and short, and uh, omega is uh, the so-called momentum, uh, which is uh, related to u s u minus u x x. Uh, so. Uh, I, I must say that uh, we are not the first one who asked this question uh, that is uh, in spectral theory. Uh, I think maybe the first uh, known to me is uh, the work of uh, Belyshev uh, more than 30 years ago. And uh, there was in connection with the kamasa holm equation, there was actually a lot of interest in this spectral problem in indefinite strings, uh, but to the best of my knowledge, basically uh, only uniqueness results uh, have been proved uh, so far, and existence is, uh, is a subtle issue. And to see that existence is a subtle issue, uh, I can explain it actually very quickly, uh, just uh, uh, we need to go back to uh, steel TS. Uh, that is, uh, as I said, uh, if we have a rational steel TS function, then a rational steel TS function, uh, every rational steel TS function is the val Tichmar function of a steel TS string. Steel TS string means that our uh, measure now is omega. Uh, uh, omega here is uh, just finitely made delta functions. So uh, the support of omega is just a uh, finite number of points. Each omega k is positive, lk is just uh, the distance between uh, uh, neighboring points, l is the total length, and uh, if m is uh, the well Tichmar function of this spectral problem, that it admits this very nice continued fraction representation. Uh, and this continued fraction representation, each coefficients here, I exact the coefficients of uh, this. Uh, measure omega, which is just point masses. So uh, you see that uh, we start omega zero is just uh, the point mass at zero. Uh, L zero is uh, the first. OK. Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, uh, because everything is uh, here purely algebraic, so still TS formulas, there is uh, one can go uh, like uh, still TS solution of the inverse uh, of, of the inverse problem or the moment problem is that uh, like uh, via Huntle determinants. So one can recover uh, if you know the spectral measure, that is, uh, if you know M, there is spectral measure, you define Huntle determinants and you can recover all the coefficients, and these are exactly the still TS formulas. Uh, uh, since it's just pure algebra, uh, it does not matter whether omega is uh, positive or may take uh, positive and negative values. Uh, but the problem is that, uh, first of all, if we allow omega k uh, to be uh, to take positive and negative values, then the corresponding m is no longer still ts, but it stays to be her Glotz function. Uh, but it turns out that not every uh, rational uh, Herglotz function admits this very nice continued fraction representation. Uh, in order to fix this representation, it turns out that uh, every rational, it's uh, not, not actually a difficult fact, every rational Herglotz function admits representation which is very much similar to the previous one. However, we replaced constants by uh, linear functions. You see, and uh, at each place here, it's uh, on the previous slides, it was just omega zero, but uh, if we go to rational Herglotz function, the corresponding continued fraction representation, we have linear functions. But uh, if we have linear functions, and just if we uh, return back to our spectral problem here, this means that we need to replace omega here by linear function. So we need to replace our spectral problem by a spectral problem which is quadratic in spectral parameter v. Uh, 
this class of problems was first introduced by Mark Crane and Heinz Lange, I think in uh, 1972. And uh, this object played a very important role in their solution of the indefinite analog of Kamburger and Stilties moment problems. So they proved the analog of Stilties formulas and uh, so on and so forth. But uh, the main fact is that, uh, as I said, uh, uh, this is uh, exactly uh, the indication that the existence issue, if we uh, try to ask uh, whether uh, there is a solution to the inverse spectral problem, uh, the existence is indeed a subtle issue as just the case of rational Herglotz functions indicate. But we can, uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, I think it's too fast, uh, a little bit later. Uh, I would like, I think it's, I hope I'm not too fast. Um, right. I would like to say a few words about the Kamasa Holm equation, which is uh, maybe the main driving force for our investigations and uh, uh, for all our results, which I'm uh, going to talk today. So uh, uh, the original form of the Kamasa Holm equation is uh, is definitely not nice. It's, uh, if you see it for the first time, it's uh, ugly. Second, third, the situation doesn't improve. Uh, this equation first appeared uh, uh, in this, uh, this paper by Fuchstein and Focus. Uh, it contains a list of uh, problems which are B-Hamiltonian. Uh, B-Hamiltonian uh, tells you that there are infinitely many conserved quantities which also indicates that probably this equation might be completely integrable in the sense that there is a lax pair, stru lax pair structure behind it. And uh, actually this equation received a lot of attention after this very short note of uh, Kamasa and Holm in 1993. So uh, first of all, uh, it turned out, uh, they observed in this paper that uh, this equation is relevant for Modeling of bundling shallow water waves, where kappa is uh, the so-called critical speed and u is velocity. Uh, actually, uh, the story regarding uh, this relevance to shallow water waves is uh, somehow a little bit fancy. And uh, like uh, the paper of Johnson says that there is a mistake in Kamasa and Holm derivation, so we fix it. Next paper says that there is mistake in Johnson's paper, but we fixed it, and uh, still there are people who complain that uh, there, there is also mistake in uh, Constantine and Lance. Uh, this is uh, not the subject. I'm definitely not an expert on uh, modeling and uh, approximation of waves and so on, but uh, At least uh, uh, the KDV regime is governed by the by the Kamasa Holm equation. This system. Uh, the, uh, there are several uh, features uh, which are governed by uh, the Kamasa Holm equation, which are not governed by the KDV equation. Uh, one of uh, uh, such an interesting features is that. Uh, a Kamasa Holm equation uh, allowed to model wave breaking. There is uh, smooth initial data may develop singularities in finite time. And uh, all these singularities develop uh, in a way that it looks like a breaking wave. There is a uh, solution stays bounded, but uh, the slope, uh, like uh, indicated on this picture, uh, the uh, left peak uh, moves to the right, right peak moves to the left, and the slope between those peaks becomes vertical at sometimes finite times t. The uh, curious and important for us uh, fact that wave breaking happens if and only uh, actually. In order to get wave breaking, we, uh, omega must, uh, must be indefinite. This momentum, which is u minus second derivative of u, must be indefinite. Uh, one more uh, curious feature of the Kamasa Holm equation is uh, it has very simple solitons and very simple soliton introduction. So if we consider, uh, uh, there are several regimes. Uh, uh, now, if, if we take kappa equal to zero, this is called uh, dispersionless regime. Uh, this will be clear a little bit later why it's called uh, dispersionless. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, but not only in this case, uh, the Kamasa Holm equation can be uh, slightly rewritten, which allows uh, to reformulate it uh, to give a, a weak reformulation of the Kamasa Holm equation. Because it's rather easy to check that uh, traveling waves for uh, this equation uh, have a very simple form. It's exactly this exponential function here. Uh, this is the plot of uh, this function with uh, p is the height is proportional to the speed of this wave. And if p is positive, then peak is positive and it moves to the right. If p is negative, uh, peak is negative and the wave moves to the left. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing is that uh, multi soliton solutions uh, are nothing but the uh, uh, superposition of one soliton solutions in this case. So if we take u to be uh, just this sum of peaks, uh, but here coefficients must depend on c. Uh, this is the typical plot of, uh, of a multi-peacon solution here. And if we make this, uh, uh, make this ansatz into the Kamasa-Holm equation, then Kamasa-Holm equation turns into a very nice and simple Hamiltonian system where the Hamiltonian is exactly the H1 norm of our solution U. Uh, this Hamiltonian system is uh, explicitly solvable, but uh, Hamiltonian is not a C1 because of this modulus here. And hence the Leoville-Arnold theorem does not apply. And uh, <clears throat> in particular, uh, this allows this wave breaking procedure. Uh, so, this is the picture, and uh, I think uh, uh, just uh, if we uh, discuss wave breaking, then uh, here we have like uh, two positive peaks and one negative positive move to the right, and the interaction happens in exactly this way. So the higher peak, of course, faster because uh, height is proportional to the speed, but uh, it does not. Uh, overtake the uh, the lower peak, it just pushes the lower peak. So there is exchange of energies and uh, these two peaks never met. And uh, uh, nothing bad happens if just two positive peaks interact between each other. So solution then uh, very nice and uh, for all times t. So bad things actually happen when positive and negative peak interact as, uh, as I said on the previous picture where I was just this uh, drawing. So it suffices actually to consider a pecan anti pecan interaction. That is, we take uh, two symmetric, like a very symmetric thing, uh, just ne uh, uh, negative peak on the right and positive peak on the left. This function, um, just by, uh, by the setup, is uh, odd. It stays odd for all times t. Uh, the corresponding uh, Hamiltonian system is uh, rather simple, but it's good exercise to solve it. And actually, all formulas can be found in, uh, in particular, in this paper by Brisson and Constantin. And the interaction of these two peaks looks exactly like this. So uh, actually, uh, separately, uh, the heights become higher and higher, but uh, these two peaks they kill each other. And for a finite times t, which uh, one can uh, actually easily compute, this situation happens. That uh, these two peaks indeed kill each other and solution disappears. So it becomes just zero. So before, uh, before this collision, everything was okay. So uh, p and q, everything is uh, very good. But there is a t cross where uh, our solution just disappears. And at this point, uh, we lose uniqueness for the uh, for weak solutions of the kamasa holm equation. Because starting from this point, for example, there are infinitely many ways to continue this solution. For example, we can continue it by zero for all times t. Or we can continue it as uh, symmetrically, like, uh, but we need to revert this picture. And uh, again, these peaks uh, emerge out of nowhere and go and uh, never interact. So positive goes to plus infinity, negative goes to minus infinity, and that's it. Actually, here are uh, the formulas, uh, uh, which uh, somehow indicate, because the important quantities for us is uh, the position of the peak Q and the speed or the height of the peak P. 
the H1 norm, which is the Hamiltonian, is uh, easily expressed in terms of P and Q. This is uh, the second formula here. Uh, the derivative, because we know uh, when T goes to T cross, Q goes to zero. And uh, the derivative of U at, uh, at zero is nothing but two pi times this exponent. And it goes to minus infinity. The interesting observation made by Brissan and Constantine in this paper is that uh, if we take the H1 norm of our solution between these two peaks, that is between minus Q and Q, it turns out it, uh, that at the limit, this quantity, like the whole energy concentrates at exactly one point. So uh, on the picture before, solution disappears. But in fact, if we, if we uh, just integrate the H1 norm of this solution between uh, positive and negative peak and take the limit when T goes to zero, then this limit turns out to be exactly our Hamilton. And uh, this suggests uh, the so-called uh, the definition of conservative solutions. Like uh, one, uh, one is interested to a unique, uh, uh, the natural way to... Uh, uh, to a unique continuation of our solutions and, of course, the most interesting solutions, solutions which conserve the energy. But uh, uh, on the one hand, this looks a little bit artificial. It is to our u, we add some uh, quantity mu, which also varies uh, with time t, but and at the times of blow up, this quantity mu somehow uh, says how much energy our solution loses in order to just continue it uniquely after the blow up. Uh, I hope I at least vaguely uh, explain what's going on Yeah, And uh, uh, yes, OK. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, the uh, uh, another interesting feature of, uh, of the kamasa holm equation, and so uh, this was indicated by Focus and Fuchstein already because uh, the kamasa holm equation has uh, infinitely many conserved quantities. This equation uh, is completely integrable in a sense that uh, it admits a lax pair structure. And Kamasa and Holm found that the lax operator in this case is exactly almost indefinite string, except this one over four. Just if you kill this one over four, this is exactly the indefinite string. Uh, the way to kill this one over four and turn it into an indefinite string, it's a very simple change of variables. And uh, so this one of this constant term is uh, not a problem at all for us. And uh, if we go for multi on solutions, uh, then this picture, spectral picture uh, in this case is uh, finitely many eigenvalues, simple eigenvalues, which are positive and negative if there are uh, uh, negative peaks, then there are negative eigenvalues. If there are positive peaks, there are positive eigenvalues. And uh, the uh, time evolution of, uh, because this problem uh, here is isospectral, means that eigenvalues are conserved quantities under the kamasa holm flow. And the evolution of norming constants, which were defined exactly on the previous slides, it's just the standard definition of uh, norming constants. This evolution is very simple. It's actually linear here. And this is, uh, uh, I think uh, most of you are familiar with the inverse uh, spectral or scattering transform, the way to solve nonlinear equations uh, by employing the uh, solution of the inverse spectral or scattering problem. It is uh, for each initial data u, we associate spectral data or scattering data, some suitable one, for example, in, uh, in, the, case, in, the, in the case of uh, multi peacons it's uh, spectrum and norming constants. Uh, then the evolution of spectral data is very simple, and uh, the difficult part now is to solve the inverse problem, that is to recover our solution for time t from spectral data at time t here. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, uh, of course, uh, despite uh, a very simple, uh, a very simple uh, picture and the idea of the inverse uh, spectral scattering transform, 
uh, there are a lot of uh, problems because uh, we need to uh, justify uh, uh, the map phi and also uh, to find what is psi, uh, psi minus one. And these problems are, of course, uh, uniqueness, whether this uh, psi like uh, we take the phase space and we take uh, the class of spectral data. What is the class of spectral data? Like we need to solve first the direct spectral problem, then the problem of existence, and the problem of recovery, and uh, the problem of, of course, uh, for nonlinear equations is the problem of stability. So uh, I, I hope this is. Uh, uh, maybe not uh, not whole, but uh, actually uh, all uh, all that is exactly our motivation to study uh, the inverse spectral theory for indefinite strings. Uh, I would like to uh, finish with uh, uh, this very but, indeed, but still. Uh, here the, the question is that uh, from this model it's clear that uh, you are interested in the whole line. Uh, yes, and uh, in your previous setting, you you started with the finite interval. Yes, yes, yes. It's finite or semi-infinite, and uh, I'm going to speak about this uh, a little bit later. But it looks like I'm terribly slow. <laughs> no, you... But since, uh, <laughs> since one hour and a half, I think I would be able to manage okay. it and uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, to yeah. explain because uh, uh, because this is the right question. Uh, since there are uh, there is a huge variety of uh, uh, initial value problems, uh, right? It's uh, periodic initial data, decaying initial data, plus uh, we also have this parameter kappa, like dispersionless and uh, case with dispersion. So, uh, so far in uh, dispersionless case, all these nice multi peaks they appear in the case when kappa is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I plan to touch this a little bit. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, this is the, uh, uh, since I was speaking about uh, uh, multi peakers and uh, continued fraction expansions, uh, actually, uh, uh, if we uh, transform, uh, where is it? Uh, transform the spectral problem into a string and uh, define uh, the M function in exactly the previous way, then for uh, for two peacons, the corresponding m function admits this very uh, short and simple continued fraction representation. Uh, of course, uh, uh, these hyperbolic uh, uh, functions here appear because of exactly uh, this one over four, which we need to kill and to transform into a string. So, uh, but just ignore these hyperbolic functions and uh, then everything is uh, nice and simple. And uh, since we have explicit formulas for P and Q, we can uh, just to look at the uh, dynamics of M. So we, uh, we look at the evolution of our M function when T goes to T cross. When T goes to T cross, then L0 goes to one over two. Because uh, uh, because we know that uh, Q goes to zero, right? And then uh, this formula says that L0 as well as L2 has uh, 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 both have a nice limit when T goes to T cross. This is one over two. Uh, L10 is uh, hyperbolic tangents and uh, uh, it goes to zero. And uh, there is problem with M1 and M2 because uh, in our formulas P goes to I think uh, plus or minus infinity, I don't remember. Uh, but in this continued fraction expansion, this L2 is nice and L0 is nice. And what happens in between is very symmetric, despite uh, this minus infinity here. It turns out that the limit is very nice. So there is cancellation and uh, in the limit we end up with uh, uh, this is the Hamiltonian, this is the H1 norm of our solution, and there is additional Z. And this Z, if you just go back to uh, continued fraction representation for rational Herglotz functions, this is exactly it. And uh, this function which appears here is the M function of quadratic spectral problem, which uh, where uh, V is a positive measure 
which is exactly the delta function sitting at zero, and uh, the coefficient in front is exactly the H1 norm of our solution. Uh, Again, as uh, as I mentioned, uh, this type of spectral problem we uh, decided to call it Krein Langa strings. It was introduced by, uh, let me underline this once again, by Mark Crane and Heinz Langa at the end of 70s. And uh, the uh, curious thing is uh, that uh, the solution of the uh, indefinite moment problem proposed by Crane and Langa, it's uh, very much similar to what we are doing here. There is, uh, they introduced some parameter T, which is like uh, if you will analyze uh, the solution of Crane and Lanka and uh, the way how to uh, integrate uh, conservative multi peacon solutions, uh, the procedures are nearly identical. Uh, they just used a different scaling, and uh, that's it. So, this, uh, uh, what I said, is uh, just uh, a very nice indication that uh, the theory of uh, generalized indefinite strings uh, or indefinite strings has very close relationship with the kamasa holm equation. And uh, in fact, it turns out that the kamasa holm equation is uh, a good uh, source and a good driving force to the complete solution of the inverse spectral problem for indefinite strings. Uh, the idea uh, I'm going to actually uh, briefly uh, explain and present it. Uh, the idea is uh, follows the main steps of Mark Crane. So if we want to solve the inverse spectral problem for uh, for strings for indefinite strings, first of all we need to enlarge the class of spectral problems. It is we uh, the uh, that we added nonlinear term here is obvious uh, from the fact that uh, uh, continued fraction representations for rational Herglotz functions. And also we need to allow omega here to be H minus one distribution uh, locally. Uh, if you uh, just uh, let me go back a little bit, where is this? Uh, um, yes, it's here. So uh, the natural phase space for the kamasa holm equation is H1, because H1 is the Hamiltonian so which stays behind the kamasa holm equation. But omega, which enters our spectral problem, is U minus second derivative of U. So uh, the second derivative of H1 function is H minus 1. So this gives a hint that the right class of spectral problems must be H minus 1. Uh, of course, uh, the question, if we uh, assume this low, uh, low regularity coefficients, uh, then how to understand this equation? Because uh, the approach of uh, Mark Crane, like to rewrite it as integral equation, is, is not okay because omega is distribution. Uh, but fortunately, uh, uh, fortunately uh, uh, the theory of ODEs with uh, low regularity coefficients attracted a lot of attention in how to call this? Two decades ago, uh, in particular, uh, in particular, there is uh, this uh, overview, this the approach suggested by Sakchuk and Shkalikov. Uh, that is, one need to understand this in a distributional sense. Uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, dive into this area. Just uh, uh, let me uh, quickly explain what's. Uh, uh, what does this mean? Uh, like, since omega is uh, h minus one, and uh, uh, this means that we can somehow multiply it or to apply it to h one functions, right? If we assume that our f is h one, then the uh, the right hand side is uh, is okay. And also, if we differentiate deliver, uh, differentiate f twice, we end up with h minus one. So, and this equality then is understood as equality for distributions and so regularity H1 and so everything fits very well. And uh, due to the people who worked in this area before, everything is quite good. In particular, uh, we have all the nice results like existence and uniqueness solutions, analyticity with spectral parameter, uh, the analogs of cosine and side type solutions. So. And once we have this, then of course we can define 
the M function uh, as as it was done for the usual crime strings. So the definition is exactly the same. Uh, however, the difference here is that M is her gloss. So it's uh, not a still yes function. This is a her gloss function. That is, it's analytic away of the uh, real line, and it is symmetric uh, with respect to uh, complex conjugation. Uh, every uh, her gloss function admits uh, this nice integral representation uh, uh, with uh, the only difference to uh, still ts functions is that rho is supported on the real line, not only on the positive semi-axis, but also uh, on the whole real line. And uh, this condition is just normalization condition in order to ensure that this integral makes sense for non-real z. Uh, I'm not going to uh, explain the uh, how it's called, uh, how to associate the uh, operator or linear relation with this nonlinear spectral problem. This is uh, a not nice uh, topic, uh, uh, like uh, because it's linear relation. And in particular, if some of you are familiar with canonical systems, then uh, you might know that canonical system is uh, a very nice object uh, until you start uh, trying to understand it as operator or linear relation in L2. And then the definition of this uh, linear relation is, uh, it's better. Uh, but uh, for us, uh, for us, uh, it's important that uh, M plays uh, the same role for uh, the spectral problem as M plays uh, the role for strings. That is, it's uh, the uh, measure row here is indeed a spectral measure that is uh, all spectral information about uh, S2 is contained in this function row, in this uh, measure row here. And uh, so, uh, in analogy to uh, crane strings, uh, we have a map, a map from all such triples, uh, uh, which we call generalized indefinite strings, that is uh, length, uh, distribution omega, and uh, positive measure V here. So uh, each such triple is uh, mapped into a Herglotz function, and it turns out that this map is homeomorphic. That is, this map is bijective, continuous, and the inverse map is also continuous. The topology, uh, the topology on the set of uh, indefinite strings is uh, a little bit uh, more complicated than the topology on uh, the set of crime strings, but the topology uh, on the set of uh, Herglotz functions is the same. It's uh, a locally uniform convergence. Actually, uh, the proof of this fact is uh, based on uh, the proof uh, on the famous uh, De branch theorem for canonical systems, uh, it is, uh, yes. And uh, I'm not so sure that I uh, have anything else to add regarding to this result. Okay, so uh, in fact, uh, in fact, this is, uh, um, oh, this is perfect. Uh, I think I would be able to finish uh, pretty soon. That uh, somehow this result is uh, is really a good indica indication that one can use uh, the theory of generalized indefinite strings in order to try to understand the kamasa holm equation by using the uh, inverse scattering transform approach. Uh, going back to a uh, question of uh, Vladislav, uh, there are several, uh, how to say, at least standard ways to pose uh, the Cauchy problem for the kamasa holm equation. Uh, uh, two standard things is to pose it on the line or on uh, with periodic initial data means that uh, on the circle. Uh, these uh, maybe three cases attracted uh, the main att attention during uh, the last, uh, I, I would say, 20 years. And uh, here the distinction is that uh, dispersion in this case when kappa is zero and uh, the case with uh, dispersion when kappa is positive. 
the phase space is uh, because H1 uh, H1 norm is uh, exactly the uh, Hamiltonian uh, of our system. Uh, the natural phase space is H1 uh, uh, times uh, finite positive Borel measures on uh, the real line or on the circle. The uh, well process of the conservative kamasa horn flow was uh, uh, proved. Uh, that is the main work actually was done by uh, Holden and Rhino and by their students, and they proved it's uh, at least all these three cases are covered by, I think, by these two publications by Holden and Rhino. And uh, let me uh, now, I'm, I'm not going to uh, speak a lot, uh, just I would like to uh, uh, talk a little bit about inverse uh, scattering transform approach. And uh, I'm not going to talk about periodic case because it's a separate story, which is a little bit, uh, it's sufficiently well understood. And uh, okay, uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, the dispersionless case, uh, which is uh, generalization of uh, the case of multi uh, uh So this is the case when kappa is equal to zero and uh, the corresponding uh, isospectral problem is exactly this. And uh, it's assumed that uh, U is H1 uh, the momentum omega, which is u minus second derivative uh, of u, hence is h minus one on the real line, and the corresponding spectral picture is like this. It's uh, just simple eigenvalues, real eigenvalues, uh, positive and negative, and uh, the uh, only assumption here is that uh, this is like well, not an assumption. Uh, that's in fact uh, the inverse of this operator is uh, Hilbert Schmidt, and actually uh, this condition here it's uh, equivalent to the fact that uh, one over lambda squared the series converges. Uh, so yeah, this is like. Uh, unfortunately, it's hard to apply, apply the uh, inverse uh, scattering transform approach under, uh, under this assumption, and for this there are uh, reasons which are, uh, which are behind uh, uh, the branch solution of the inverse problem for canonical systems, uh, because in this case the corresponding uh, determinant is uh, like its entire function, but its order is uh, higher than uh, its, its two. So and uh, one needs to impose some further assumptions. In particular, it suffices to uh, assume that uh, the inverse is just trace class operator. And in this case, uh, one indeed can develop the inverse scattering transform approach. In particular, uh, one can prove that, uh, as I said, under uh, this assumption, a uh, weak solution uh, to the conservative kamasa holm equation, it splits uh, into a train of single pecans. Like asymptotically, uh, if you take uh, this initial data, then for large times, this uh, solution looks like just uh, a superposition of multi beacons. Uh, the uh, best reference uh, for this is uh, this recent paper by uh, Jonathan. It was published in ARMA just uh, three years ago. So, and uh, in fact, uh, this dispersionless case is uh, definitely the most understood uh, case uh, of initial data for the kamasa holm equation. Uh, this is uh, now the uh, actually work in progress. Uh, and this case uh, is uh, definitely very far from being uh, well understood. So, if we uh, if we take uh, uh, for simplicity kappa is taken uh, uh, equal to one because it's just scaling and uh, nothing else, so uh, this simplifies just our spect spectral picture. Uh, the only difference to the previous slide is that omega minus one is now uh, belongs to h minus one. So this somehow shifts uh, not shift spectra. Uh, because, uh, uh, as, as I uh, mentioned this once, uh, Z spectral parameter enters our equation in the wrong way. 
So if you, uh, for Schrodinger equation, uh, if you shift potential by Q, this just shifts spectra. But if here you take a minus one, then uh, this changes the structure of spectrum. So the general picture, uh, spectral picture in this case, like if we assume that, uh, <clears throat> uh, if we assume that, uh, again, uh, phase space is like this, but uh, omega minus one is H minus one, then uh, the spectrum, uh, our spectrum now uh, contains non-trivial essential spectrum, which fills the semi-axis starting from one over four. And the point spectrum is also large in general. So there are infinitely many positive eigenvalues and infinitely many negative eigenvalues. In particular, if you have, uh, for example, if your V uh, here is function, not uh, measure containing infinitely many point masses, or just measure which uh, bears uh, infinitely, uh, like with infinite support, then you for sure have infinitely many negative eigenvalues. But these eigenvalues, they accumulate to minus infinity. Uh, the standard uh, decay and uh, positivity restrictions to implement the inverse scattering transform approach in this situation is first of all to assume that there is no quadratic term, that uh, omega minus one is positive and omega minus one uh, goes to zero sufficiently fast. Plus usually people assume some smoothness. And in this case, one can transform this uh, uh, spectral problem into one dimensional Schrodinger equation, and then everything looks like KDV equation. So the uh, the flow behaves like uh, the KDV equation, and uh, a lot of people say that the Kamasa Holm equation is uh, more or less the same as the KDV. But uh, once you remove positivity assumption, like uh, once you remove uh, any uh, any of those, life becomes terribly complicated. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, only some like uh, some attempts to develop scattering theory because there is uh, uh, essential spectrum. So you need some scattering theory and uh, scattering theory on indefinite background. Uh, this is this paper by uh, Benevitz, Brown and uh, Weikart, but only some uniqueness issues uh, are addressed and uh, no attempts to, uh, to prove uh like classification of uh, scattering data this problem seems to be uh, terribly complicated and of course uh, the question is uh like what happens like can we say something uh, more uh, concrete about uh spectrum for this class of initial data and it turns out that uh the solution of the inverse spectral problem, that's this uh, theory which I uh, stated before, uh, is, uh, is a very useful tool in doing uh, direct spectral theory for this problem here. In particular, uh, our somehow maybe uh, main result is, uh, is here, that uh, if we assume that U minus one is uh, belongs to H1 on the real line, V is a finite, uh, is a positive finite measure on the real line too, then uh, the absolutely continuous spectrum of this problem also fills the uh, semi, uh, um, this is not semi-axis, this ray, one over four infinity. Uh, unfortunately, right now, I can't say anything definite about a uh, singular spectrum that is, uh, whether uh, embedded eigenvalues are possible or non-trivial singular continuous spectrum, uh, I think that the answer is yes, everything is possible. That uh, under these uh, assumptions on U and V, uh, the singular continuous spectrum of this problem might be very non-trivial. Uh, if I have, I think, uh, I would be able to finish actually in five minutes. Uh, I would like to give a very short sketch of the proof or like to indicate what stays behind this theorem. Uh, however, it, it would be a little bit useful to, uh, to prove not uh, uh, the first theorem, but the second theorem uh, here, because uh, how to say, uh, uh, okay. Uh, 
uh, somehow uh, these results are very much similar actually and uh, uh, in fact theorem which is uh, the first theorem on this slide is uh, uh, to a certain extent corollary of the second one uh, because the second one is about generalized indefinite strings and so we just need to make a transformation of like we need to kill this one over four by changing variables and then we would be able to go from the above to the slide below uh, regarding uh, spectral analysis of uh, these type of spectral problems uh, actually uh, this is uh, a complicated story for obvious reasons uh the uh, the main problem is that uh spectral uh, uh spectral parameter enters in uh, uh sits in a, in a wrong place and uh, the usual uh, the usual approach to analyze uh, uh the structure of uh, essential spectrum is uh, perturbation theory uh, but perturbation theory, uh, uh, it's uh, it's hard to see uh, the operator here is like uh, at least it's immediately not obvious how to how how to see this. Uh, like if you uh, take additive perturbation of omega, uh, then to see the spectral problem as additive perturbation of unperturbed omega is not completely clear how to do this. Uh, moreover. Uh, uh, Another uh, obstacle here is uh, like if you use perturbation theory, then uh, the uh, Katarzyn Bloom theorem says that the absolutely continuous spectrum is uh, conserved under trace class perturbations. But uh, here our perturbations, that is, if we go to uh, like this theorem below, we uh, assume that V is finite measure. And uh, if V is finite measure, then uh, uh, the Hilbert-Schmidt uh, class is equivalent that uh, our measure is not only finite, it has finite first moment here. So uh, even the standard perturbation theory technique is uh, no longer applicable. But for us, uh, it turns out that the crane branch correspondence, this is the solution of the inner spectral problem, is uh, a terribly powerful tool uh, because uh, since we also have, uh, on the one hand, nonlinear equation and conservation laws, which come from this nonlinear equation, and if we combine this with screen the branch correspondence, then one would be able to prove very nice results. In particular, these two theorems here are exactly uh, the proof which follows the scheme of uh, suggested by uh, Dave and Kilip in this way beautiful paper uh, where they proved that uh, the absolutely continuous spectrum of 1D Schrodinger on the real line with M2 potentials coincides with the positive semi-axis. And uh, the two main ingredients here uh, in the proof of the Dyke and Kilip is first of all conservation laws for the KDB equation. And the second is uh, uh, some sort of continuity, like if you write potential in some nice way, then uh, there is you would be able to control also your spectral measures. Uh, in our case, uh, in particular for the second theorem, conservation laws uh, or dispersion relations or trace formulas or some rules, it looks very nice and simple, where A is uh, just uh, the standard uh, transmission coefficients, and if we indeed assume some additional smoothness assumptions on our coefficients, then we would be able to prove this nice statement here. And uh, the right hand side indeed then provides uh, control on uh, the first summon. That is uh, control actually on two summons, because uh, on the first one, uh, with this, you would be able to end up with some uh, analog of Lipterian uh, inequalities for eigenvalues. And uh, the second sum here provides control on the absolutely continuous part of your measure. Uh, also, Alexei, uh, one uh, small yes. question about this term. So I can see a very strong singularity at zero. Yes. So yes, is it really is. that the solution be behaves like a very strong exponential at zero to compensate it? Or how yes, you a, uh, a has uh, zero, I think, of order two. That is, uh, uh, if 
uh, here I did not say what is uh, what is this class of uh, uh, F zero, but uh, so uh, but the choice is made to to make F uh, to be entire function. And uh, this A then has uh, zero of order two at zero. Actually, uh, because it's K and logarithm, I think maybe even three. The first three derivatives of A and plus it's uh, some really, uh, yes, this is, uh, I do not remember right now. It's, uh, the paper was written a long time ago and my memory is bad. But uh, you're right. This k uh, k over four at zero it's it's killed by by our a no I think it's ah I'm lying a little bit so a actually behaves like one plus uh, the first Taylor coefficient is zero the second Taylor coefficient is zero and probably the third one is zero as well but the fourth one in order to kill this k over four it's uh, it's not zero. But uh, it is real and it kills it because we take logarithm not, not of A, but logarithm of modulus of A. So yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. It's, uh, this is uh, surprising. It's, uh, when we derived it, we saw that this is something like oh, we are wrong, but it's like that. Uh, but also the, uh, uh, I would like to finish with this, that's actually, uh, we believe that uh, we uh, we would be able uh, not only to prove this easy part of dived key, actually uh, we would be able to prove a complete characterization of uh, spectral data for uh, for this spectral problem with uh, these coefficients. That is, we believe that the analog of Kilip Simon result is possible, and this is our. Uh, project uh, like our ongoing project with Jonathan now. But uh, going back to the question of Vladislav, it's uh, of course absolutely unclear how to, for example, apply uh, uh, Kilip Simon to uh, investigate the KDV equation with L2 initial data. Yes. And I think this is, uh, I would like to skip the next slides and formulas. This is some uh, some of our papers and I think this is definitely a very good time to stop. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Right. How will be in Russian this dynamical compliance of this? Coefficient dynamic податливости. податливости. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what, what does this mean. It's uh, uh, the right person to ask is Mark Crane or Israel Katz, but unfortunately, uh, it's too late to ask them. Maybe, uh, or some people who are working in Alex, uh, I do not know. And uh, what about the situation which is not so general? Suppose that uh, you know that your coefficient v is equal to one, and you only want to recover omega. No, 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 no. Uh, okay, uh, uh, you can make the same uh, like Kamasa uh, hole with dispersion, but you can make the same thing to uh, coefficient mu here, which is measure. This is called mm -hmm. two-component Kamasa hole equation. And uh, if you uh, if you take uh, where is it uh, like instead of omega minus one you take v minus one is finite measure then this situation is very much similar to zero so then your spectrum becomes like one over four to infinity and minus minus one over four to minus infinity and all the same problems. Uh, I think, uh, did I? Ah, 
this is uh, the last paper here. This is uh, regarding proteins. So it's possible to prove the same result, but uh, how to do the uh, inverse scattering transform approach? It's uh, it's a very good and uh, complicated question. Like, what is the replacement of uh, scattering coefficients in this case? This is just. A very important problem, I think. Any questions? Do you remember that probably your microphones are muted? Well, it's, not, it's hard to hear you. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm asking if there are more questions. And uh, just uh, remember that your microphones are, are probably muted. I hope I was not too fast. <laughs> but you touched uh, a lot of things. Uh, in your talk, so it was uh, really interesting. Yeah. It's, uh, but this is indeed like uh, a very nice interaction that you you take uh, insights from one to another and everything interacts. So just if you remove one piece from this talk, it's. Okay. Generalized indefinite strings just by setup, they does not look nice. And okay. Usual, uh, uh, in fact, for, for example, if you uh, uh, if you consider the papers on on this um, uh, non-regular coefficients, uh, for example, like uh, the technique of Shkalikov and then the, the works of Grinif uh, yes, yeah. co-authors, uh, they usually use the factorization and in fact reduce uh, everything to some Dirac equation. Uh, uh, Dirac system, I mean. So, but, but here in fact you, you didn't work it uh, this way, yeah? Uh, actually, it's possible uh, because, uh, in fact, our proof of uh, uh, this uh, inner spectral theorem is uh, uh, just, uh, it's possible to reduce uh, this generalized indefinite string into a canonical system. So, uh, it's possible to proceed in uh, more or less the same way. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is, uh, uh, of course, uh, like uh, you have one object and you can write uh, write it down in many ways. Like uh, all Hilbert spaces are separable Hilbert spaces, it's just L2 space. But uh, some operator in a concrete L2 space has a very nice form. And uh, sometimes it's uh, convenient to work with Dirac system, sometimes with Krein system, sometimes with canonical system. But sometimes with generalized indefinite strings. Okay. <laughs> so, if there are other questions, at least it uh, it doesn't seem to be the case. No. So, thank you very much again. Alexei, yeah, for this very, very interesting talk. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Adiós a todos. Hay que cuidarse. Nos vemos, Héctor. Hasta luego, buenas tardes. Hasta luego, muchas gracias. Hasta luego, gracias. Y Hasta luego. Hasta luego, muchas gracias.
Ladislav, ¿me escuchas, Ladislav? Sí, sí, sí. 